In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Chris Lee Show. He's founder of Super Mega Ultra Groovy. Have you ever wondered what it takes to create an award-winning iPhone app? He's won the Apple Design Award, and he talks about his nine-year journey of creating apps for Mac. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Chris Lisho. He's CEO of Super Mega Ultra Groovy. It's based in Toronto. It's a company that produces software for musicians and audio professionals. Now, his outstanding work, development work, has won him Apple's Design Award and other honors, and his Capel 3.0 app, allows musicians to learn any song from their iTunes library more quickly, more accurately. I was amazing. I was watching the video, Chris, and you can literally just drag a song into this app and it breaks down pretty much the notes. You could slow it down. You could speed it up. It was pretty amazing, among many other features, which we'll talk about. Um, And some of his other apps include Fuzz Measure Pro and Tape Deck. Chris, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, Now, we get a lot of comments from people. They have tons of ideas. They don't know where to start. They have a current product or service. They're trying to get traction, sales. It's not growing as fast as they want. Sometimes they have a fear of failure, embarrassment. They don't even start at all. Um, So we want to talk about your nine-plus year journey of creating apps for Mac and how did you get from that idea to making that first sale. And I always like to include a fun fact to make you real to the audience. And... A fun fact about Chris is he goes big or he goes home. And this is kind of a story. He, he just want to simply wax his car. And Chris, what did you get? Because uh, I was tired of doing it by hand. So I, I went out and bought a, a dual action polisher to, to do it for me. So yeah, I, I like to take things to the extreme, even in the smallest menial things in life. And which we'll hear about in your apps. And we'll get into that. I want to hear first about kind of what's influenced you growing up because you know you're an entrepreneur you have your own business it wasn't you know you were working at a big company but from early on when you were growing up what uh influenced you with your parents um well my parents ran their their own business um it's still in business uh they they do you know uh renovations and uh custom cabinetry and flooring and and so on and um Growing up, it was just it was part of of, of our life, and uh, you know at the dinner table it'd be conversations about what happened at work, and you know they worked together, so it would just be conversations over the dinner table. So me and my sister would get to to hear that uh, on a regular basis, but it uh, it was just the way things were. I never I wasn't really exposed to the you know working for the man sort of lifestyle for for the greater part of my life. Do you remember them talking about anything about that was tough about being in your own business early on? Uh, not particularly. I mean, um, I was younger at the time, so nothing really stands out. I, I would assume, I mean, knowing now, or knowing then, or if I had known then what I know now, there it is. Um, the, you know, it was, it was, the typical stress is, you know, related to income, you know, it's, it's either coming in fast and things are good or it's getting a little slow and things are a little tougher. So there, I definitely got to experience the, the up and downs of that. But at the same time, I, I think my parents did a good job of mostly keeping us, you know, isolated from a lot of that. Yeah. And did you ever have to, I know you were talking a little bit about you had to go out on some of the jobs um, to work. Um, yeah. Um, so over the summers, when I was old enough to do it, and I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly when I started, um, but I would go out and um, I would help with deliveries. Uh, we'd drive around town and you know deliver drywall to one job or deliver tiles to another, or you know we'd just be driving around town. And uh, sometimes I'd get lent out uh, to the actual job sites to do things like demolition and carrying out the stuff and. One time I got to work the jackhammer, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> nice. So, Chris, and the other thing was, I mean, obviously when you have your own business, you're, you know, your parents are, you have to work a lot, and you have to do anything that needs to be done for the business. Um, what did your seven-year-old say recently? 
Because you have to do a lot of work with your apps. Yeah, I mean, lately I've been in crunch mode, and um, it was like in the middle of summer, and, and one time my, my son, Andrew, just, just asked me like, innocently, you know, what what did you go to school for? Like, what do you do? And you know, I told him, I got a degree in math and computer science and, and whatever. He's like, okay, good daddy. I just want to make sure I know what not to do so that I can spend time with my kids when I grow up. Wow. That's painful. <laughs> it, yeah, it was, it was gut-wrenching at the time, but um, it, it's, you know, it, at the same time, I, I, you know, looking back, you know, times were different then in, in terms of, um, you know, how much time people would spend with their kids in general. Uh, like back then, you would never see parents in a schoolyard. And nowadays, you drop your kid off at school and the whole schoolyard is filled with all the parents taking their kids to school and socializing in the yard with them. So I, it's, it's kind of funny because I feel like I see them a ton, you know, day to day. I take them to the bus stop every day. Um, and yet, you know, it's never enough. <laughs> you think he just sees like all the other parents there? It's like where's dad or something? I don't even know if it's that. I think it's to be honest. I think it was just a particular situation where he wanted to do something with me, and for whatever reason, I was I, I had to duck out of it. And you know, I I'm sorry, I got a lot of work to do today. And and then it must have been a couple of days after that where he you know reflected on that and brought it up. Right. You know, stab in the heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I ask that because a lot of people go think, okay, you start your own business, you should have more time for whatever you want. But the reality is you, you know, you have to do everything. So, I would say you, you can have more time. And there are periods where I do have a ton of flexibility, but it's just, it's not constant. You can't just retire. You can just start a business and walk away. Right. Uh, there are businesses where you can do that, but I don't see myself running one. <laughs> right. And I want to talk about, too, Chris, with the uh, how you came up with the idea and how you knew it was worth it to pursue. But you didn't start just out of the gate with your own business. Where were you working before? Uh, I was working at RIM out of school. Um, RIM is now BlackBerry. And um, I, had a, I had a job there working on... Um, you know, one of their many projects internally. And um, it was a good job. I was surrounded by really great people, a lot of fun. You know, we all got along. Everybody was really smart. And um, I, I enjoyed myself there. Um, but at the same time, I always had this nagging thing that I, I have always wanted to start my own business or do something on my own. And um, it was actually a hobby of mine uh, that led me to to create fuzz measure to kind of scratch my own itch. Oh, Chris, I want to hear about too what you learned, or maybe what you learned what not to do at Rim. What was one of those those times? Um, yeah, I, I kind of mentioned in, when we talked earlier that um, the lessons at Rim weren't were totally not uh, in what to do. Although they had some valuable lessons uh, in that, but one thing that always struck me was. Um, I, I had started as a co-op student in 2002 during RIM's first layoff, uh, major layoff. And um, later on when I joined the company was, was a few years after that. So they were kind of out of the woods, so to speak. But it was very obvious uh, throughout the way that, that they were just growing faster than they could handle. And I think... I don't think that was their fault. I don't think they did anything really wrong. Maybe, I mean, obviously some might argue with me and considering their position, but um, you know, I think it would be very easy for somebody to fall into the trap of, um, we have all this work we need to do, let's hire a ton of people and just throw them at that work. And um, it just, once you get to that point, your burn rate goes up, you know, it becomes a little bit more stressful, it's harder to manage all those people, and then suddenly you find yourself with a, a quarter or two where you're not doing so well, and now you're stuck in this position where, well, we, we increased our burn rate, what do we do now? Um, so yeah, it's, that's sort of a, a overarching theme, if you will, you know, where, where a company starts to grow really quickly and the culture changes and, and the problems change. And um, if anything, I walked away realizing that 
um, any kind of growth uh, needs to be slow, controlled growth. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So when I know you have, you know, for people, you have fuzz measure, tape deck, capo. What was the first one that you created and where'd you get the idea? Um, so fuzz measure was the first product. And uh, when I created it, it wasn't really, I don't think it was with the intention of creating a product. Um, I was building some speakers to use in my home theater just as a hobby. And um, when I got sort of to the end, I, I realized that there were no tools for me to validate whether, whether that they were any good. <laughs> and um, in, in discovering that, I decided, well, you know, this would be something interesting enough for me to spend some time writing a little bit of software and trying to automate this measurement process a little bit. And um, I did that. And when I was done, I decided, hey, I'll, I'll sell this version for a few bucks and hopefully I can cover the costs of, you know, I have to buy a couple of pieces of audio hardware here and there to test my software to know, am I Am I talking to audio hardware properly? How would you know if you don't buy audio hardware? But all this stuff costs money and I wanted the business to pay for its, itself, its own growth from an early stage. You know, some people call that bootstrapping and that's how I saw it. Um, you know, there was almost no personal investment in the beginning. I had some audio hardware and had computers obviously. Um, so it was just a matter of time and building the product and any sales went back into uh, buying equipment. At the time, I didn't have to pay my living expenses for my company, so it was very easy to get that off the ground. Um, over time, that started to grow as the market grew. Um, you know, it, it started off sort of with a circle of hobbyists, and then more professional people started to see it, and professional people had more needs and started to make requests of me, and I would keep continually responding to those requests, and over time, the product um, gained enough of a, of a market for me to make um, almost what I was making at RIM. There, there wow. was definitely a pay cut involved. And this is with fuzz measure? This was with just fuzz measure. And so in uh, early 2008, on my birthday, February 8th, I decided, on, well, I decided before then, but that was the day I left, uh, and decided to, to take a pay cut and see if um, putting all my time into the product would result in making up, hopefully making up uh, the difference. Yeah. And if it was a pay cut, it was a pay cut. I mean, I decided with my wife that we'd, we'd go for it because I didn't want to wake up one day, you know, 30 years down the road wondering what would have happened if I had done it. Right. So um, we did it and shortly thereafter I shipped Tape Deck. So it was in 2008 that uh, I shipped Tape Deck. I want to go back to fuzz measure for a second because sure. this is sort of interesting because most people go to Best Buy or some store and they buy speakers. Now you yep. decided, one, you were going to create, make your own speakers. And two, yep. you're going to create a software um, to see if they actually work. You know, that, that, that entails an extreme amount of work in itself. What made you decide to do that in the first place? Um, you know, it was... I, I've always had a like uh, a love of you know sound and audio and stuff. I, I don't consider myself an audiophile at all. Um, but you know, at the low point of of the price spectrum, where most people are buying speakers, um, what you could build for the same money would just be immensely better. It takes some work and takes some time, and heck, now now you could probably easily find pre-made schematics and and everything to just build good sounding speakers from a set of plans, um, I just decided to, to do something that was pretty simple. I mean, I think the project cost me you know, $200 or something like that. It wasn't very expensive, but I did want to verify that the claims of you know, the manufacturers who created the little loudspeaker drivers, uh, that they were kind of telling the truth that these were in fact good sounding full range drivers. And, you know, I, I don't know that it was 100% me scratching an itch and, or if it was a split between me scratching an itch because I saw the potential business opportunity in supplying that product that wasn't there on the Mac. Yeah. Um, and, you know, whatever, whatever the mixture was, whatever the motivation was, it, it just came together and, and I started moving forward from there. And 
I don't think I put too much, um, I don't want to say I didn't put much thought into it, but it, it felt like it was just all coming really naturally. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mentioned taking the money and paying for hardware to, to continue development. It, it's almost like every next step just kind of presented itself to me as it came at me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was uh, based on what what you describe as quite a crazy endeavor. <laughs> so when you, I mean, when you go to create Fuzz Measure and then you go to sell Fuzz Measure, at that time, there was not an app store, right? So how do you sell it? Right. Um, so I sold direct, um, which involved, um, you could go one of two ways. You could either set up your own store or you could use a um, uh, an electronic goods selling service. Um, I actually forgot about this, but um, for a very short period, I used one of those services where they would take like, I think it was 6% off of the top of your sales, you know, to handle the transaction and the, you know, eventual potential chargebacks and stuff like that. Um, So I used that service in the beginning, uh, but eventually had to build my own store. So in terms of the accepting money, that was, that was the, uh, the process, but um, actually putting the product out there, um, what that involved was, um, posts on a, an internet forum uh, for guys who build their own speakers and amplifiers and other crazy stuff for fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, and from there it, it just kind of snowballed. You know, you get a handful of purchases that cover the odd little piece of hardware. Um, I mean, we're talking in the hundreds of dollars. This is some big money. <laughs> I mean, how did you even get the first initial sales? Did you just reach out to people who are who love audio? Did you go on forums? How did you get the word I guess, out? I guess I kind of started the reaching out um, during development too because I did realize, I mean, I put the feelers out there to say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this. And if anyone else is interested, download a beta copy and try it out. And I think from there, that might have started some of the initial buzz, if you will, um, to at least alert people to the impending release of such a product. Right. But, um, I mean, we're... We're talking like tens of customers in the beginning. Like this, this wasn't big stuff to start out with. It was, it was very much a hobby that was just covering itself. Yeah, I mean, because you built it enough to where you felt comfortable enough to leave your, your good position. Um, Definitely. So yes. Were you thinking at the time? Was there a specific number that you were like, okay, when I hit this, I'm going to leave? Or what was your plan of? of leaving I guess because most people may be thinking about that right now or someone may be thinking that and go well what, where do I start how do I know I mean you never know when the right time is but what was it for you at the time I definitely wasn't thinking about leaving my job I actually at the time my job was starting to get really interesting for the first time in the four or five years that I had been there. Um, so the, the drive to stay was, was higher than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was happening was my company um, was making, I, I think one day I was just sitting down and you know going over whether it was for taxes or something like that. I was just kind of going over the history and, and doing some mental exercises like, you know, how far off am I? And it turned out that, you know, it's a pay cut. And at the, I think at the time I was starting some work on tape deck or, or, or the seeds of, of the idea were coming in. So I knew there was another product coming around the corner. And so with that in mind and with sort of the pay cut, you know, we, we discussed it over the holidays that year. Just, you know, I don't even know that I fully was ready to do it. It's my wife and I just talked about it and and we decided let's try it out. I mean, my boss was super cool about it. When I did tell him that I was going to leave, he was like, well, good luck. I mean, I hope it works out, but if it doesn't, you know, we're here. We, you know, we enjoy working with you. So uh, it was never a question of burning bridges. You you have a fallback if something, I mean, yeah, it it was, it was very much a, a situation I was getting into, um, that, you know, it, it was, it would have been crazy not to do it looking back, you know, even, even if it just was six months and we decided, wow, this is terrible. I need to go back to work. Yeah. 
It's easier looking back, though. I mean, at the time, of though, course. you know, you're married and you have a good, I had a, good position. I had a small baby at the time, too. Oh, small baby. Oh, small even baby. yeah, even so, more. Yeah. So um, looking back, but but at the time, it's it's not easy decision to make. No, um, it it's kind of weird because it. I don't feel like we really went through that much turmoil about it. I don't think we were that nervous about it. I don't know if it was the support from people at work. Well, I guess that came later, but I, I think I, I knew that things were good at work and in terms of relationships. Um, I knew that um, there was income. And, I, and I, at that point, I mean, the product had already been out for I think three years. So I had enough sales data to know um, how how much turmoil there was in terms of ups and downs for different seasons and stuff. It's a very actually, niche product. It's a very yeah, niche product. I was going to say, um, surprisingly, Fuzz Measure has a fairly flat revenue um, curve. Um, there's no real ups and downs. Yeah. Um, it's it's fairly consistent most most times. And... Um, with that in mind, I, I knew that, you know, we had X amount in savings and we had other things to fall back on. Um, I, w- I wasn't too worried about it, I, I think. I don't know if that helped, if that helped make it easier to, to jump. I, I would imagine it made it easier to, to do it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it probably also helped me uh, not feel too stressed in the beginning. Because, you know, in the beginning, when you do cut off your income, you immediately cut off your income. It's, it's not like a gradual thing. And it's not like the day after you leave your job, your sales go up. So yeah. there, there was that period. But like I said, I had an ace in my, in my pocket with, with Tape Deck, and I knew that there was going to be a launch. And yeah. with something like software, having more than one product uh, doesn't hurt uh, financially. Um, but I can get into that later. It yeah. definitely does make things difficult from a development standpoint. So I want to hear about Tape Deck 2 and when, you know, what happened with that, but you did win an award for Fuzz Measure. What was that? In 2006, so this was while I was still working at my day job, I had won an award, uh, the, the Apple Design Award for Fuzz Measure. And um, that was just incredible. I mean, that's a pretty high honor for, for any Apple developer on any platform. And, um, you know, it's like this guy working on this product as a hobby by himself. Yeah. Um, so to give people an idea, what other type of companies have, have won the Apple Design Award? Um, you know, I think the same year that I had won that design award, I think World of Warcraft won the gaming category. Um, and in previous years, NASA won the scientific um, category, which I was in. So, I mean, definitely no shortage of big companies. Yeah. Um, Adobe may have even got one in a previous year. I, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the, and, and that totally made it even even more amazing for me because I mean, here's this guy working out of his basement on a hobby who pulls this design award from Apple. That's you know that that's very uh, confidence boosting and and um, you know it, it was definitely exciting at the time and it 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 might have been what started the ball rolling for me to want to do my own software for a living and and see you know if I'm capable of doing this design award winning product by myself. You know, what if I put my mind to other products? And actually worked on it more on a full-time basis and not just yes, around exactly. your work. So exactly. does that make you a celebrity, like a software conference? What what changes after you win a war like that? Really. I mean, oh. We have our celebrities. I definitely um, am not a complete unknown out there, but I, I'm certainly not a celebrity or persona or anything like that. I've... <laughs> I've only ever spoke at one conference, um, whereas I have peers who have spoken at, you know, at, they speak at least once or twice a year, um, you know, so I, I definitely don't feel that I've, you know, become famous from it or anything like that. But um, I, I, I am fortunate in that um, maybe that has helped me gain some maybe notoriety uh, in or 
maybe more accurately respect. Street credibility. Yeah, some credibility, you know, um, so that when somebody, when I do talk with people, they, they realize that, hey, I'm not just some Joe Schmo. <laughs> mm. You know, I, I, I'm kind of capable of doing this stuff. Yeah. So you get fuzz measure out there, and then next is Tape Deck. What do you do to launch and make uh, that a successful launch with Tape Deck? Um, thanks to the Design Award and um, trying to get out in the community a little bit more after that, I, I did build some contacts and some intelligence about uh, which news organizations, um, you know, whenever I did a fuzz measure release, I would have to send um, emails to people and, and inform them about the product. But with a product like fuzz measure, I could never expect something like a review or anything like that because a lot of people would see the product and say, hey, this is cool. I have no idea what it does, but it looks really cool and I want a design award. Um, but with that in mind, now building this product that was much more mass market, um, I, I so what think does Tape Deck do? I get what does Tape Deck do? Just tape Deck is, it, it kind of replicates um, an old uh, cassette deck, and um, it looks like a cassette deck. It works like a cassette deck. Um, you know, when you when you press the record button, both the record and play buttons hold down just like you would expect on an old school That's funny. cassette deck. Um, you know, it, it behaves very much like that. Uh, some people call it a little bit kitschy or whatever, but um, what we found over time is that some people love the familiarity of it and it makes a lot of sense to them. And we've had in many instances um, people like doctors and lawyers and therapists who they would typically use a physical cassette recorder, but, you know, in the digital age, they don't, they're not familiar with they're not going to launch GarageBand or Pro Tools or something like that just to record a meeting. Um, and, you know, using QuickTime or something like that isn't very friendly still. Um, so, you know, this is an option for them to just load and, you know, crack open their Mac laptop and hit record and not think about it too much. Mm -hmm. So we knew we had something with that. And um, it was very appealing to the people that we reached out to because we got some coverage um, around the Mac world and people seemed to like it. At, at the time, it, you know, it pulled in a lot of revenue that um, because of the proximity, the time proximity to leaving my job, it totally lent credibility to the move to begin with. And in closing out the year of, of 2008, I think, so the, the, the worry about leaving my job and taking a pay cut was completely erased by the end of the year. By the end of the year, all said and done, I had effectively made exactly the same as if I hadn't left, or if I hadn't left to begin with. Yeah, that's and amazing. Considering I left in February, that's pretty good. Yeah. So, what do you do? I mean, someone may have an app or some kind of software. What do you? What did you do to to get more sales with Tape Deck? Um, with Tape Deck, um, we still didn't have the app store at the time. So you didn't have a lot in the way of um, promotion from Apple. So you were very much on your own. Anytime you would do an update, that was kind of uh, your best bet at getting sort of free advertising, if you will. Anytime you update a product, it would show up at the top of, say, MacUpdate.com or at the time, Virgin Tracker was really big. Um, and Apple used to host its own download site for, for a long time. And that was actually a really big one. Um, it was a big one because um, every Mac, you know, there's a little Apple menu at the top left of your screen. One of the items in that menu was get software and it would take you to that website. So if you could get featured on that website, it would be fantastic. So I would, you know, make, make a point of ensuring that my apps were listed on all of those sites and that, you know, hopefully I would get some kind of editorial praise of some sort in the form of featuring or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was just a matter of, having a good product and making myself visible to the right people uh, in the media and within Apple. You know, they, they do have people that are in external facing roles that are, you know, there to help you as developers, but they're also always on the lookout for cool stuff. Yeah. So, you know, as far as increasing sales, I don't think that anything had ever really improved sales beyond just releasing new versions with new features and getting that coverage again. Um, so constantly it, it, updating, kind of put it, 
you know, kind of put it top of people's mind because it kept getting relisted as there's updates. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. I mean, the equivalent now would be um, you would have to effectively, uh, because of, especially because of the dollar amounts of the apps, um, it would be the equivalent of, you know, Angry Birds comes out and Angry Birds sells a bazillion copies. But if, if they had just stopped there, eventually it would just completely trail off. But they didn't do that. They, they did the right thing and they just capitalized it like crazy. They, you know, brought in other properties like Star Wars and they worked on the space version or, or whatever. They, they were very smart about, you know, using or leveraging their product but doing new stuff with it. Yeah. And um, I didn't really do that much with Tape Deck because Capo was sort of <laughs> stole my yeah. stole my heart. If you so know. what? So how'd you get the idea for Capo? And, or tell people a little about what it does. Uh, it's pretty remarkable, actually. So Capo is a tool that helps musicians learn uh, their favorite music by ear. And um, when I, I I didn't start learning guitar until quite late in my life. So it was in late 2007 that I first picked up a guitar with the intention of kind of learning by myself, a combination of YouTube and websites and so on and so forth. And when I finally decided to to start taking some real lessons, um, it was then that I started to be pointed to the importance of learning stuff by ear. It was in my first or second lesson that I was told, okay, you want to learn how to play the song? Well, you go away and you listen to it and you figure it out. And in doing so... Um, that seems impossible, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's easier than it sounds. It really is. And um, in doing so, I realized that there were tools out there to, to help you do this, but all of the tools that existed were cross-platform apps that targeted Mac um, and PCs, and in some cases, Linux as well. And when you're doing that, you're kind of you're forced to pick sort of the lowest common denominator of features to, to satisfy all the platforms. And I, having previous experience developing, quote, good Mac software, uh, I decided, well, if, if I can kind of put my touch on this idea, I think I could make something that is better. Um, I had actually purchased one of the competitor softwares as a user and was using it for maybe two days before I decided this is terrible. Nobody should have to use this software. This is ridiculous so I, I'm gonna go out there and, and quote eat their lunch like I, I, I can totally do this better so what did and, you see that was terrible that you wanted to include or what features you wanted to include in yours you want to make sure it was in yours um, it, it was a collection of things one the sound quality wasn't very good to me I, I, I you know I had a hunch that something was wrong with it from the beginning and, and I later in, in testing my own software I validated that I don't know what they're doing, but it, it either plays too loud or something like that and distorts the audio while doing it slowing. Um, there were problems where keystrokes didn't make sense. You know, if you're in iTunes or QuickTime or something like that, you hit the space bar to play or pause or do whatever. Um, whereas other software would use weird keys uh, like either the P button or commas and periods and other weird stuff like that. And I thought, that's ridiculous. Like the space bar is the biggest target on your keyboard. You don't have to think to press it. Um, you know, silly little things like that just all gave me enough uh, of, of, of a uh, starting point to say, right. you know, I can't be the only one that's frustrated by this. So. I uh, went on, built the product, worked with a designer, and uh, we came up with um, with version 1.0, which effectively did what the competition did. Uh, we slowed music without affecting pitch, uh, and you could also modify the pitch to transpose songs into other keys. Um, and then shortly after that, I released a, a 1.1 release that added some effects like vocal removal and, and panning and stuff like that which basically put me on par with everything that was out there at the time. Yeah. Um, so how did you get more sales with, with Capo? How did you get it out there? That, that was a similar launch as Tape Deck. I had my, um, quote, notoriety, if you will. Um, I, I, at that point, I had a reputation for building nice things that worked very well and were easy to use. Um, so... That definitely helped people 
I think, I, I hope <laughs> that helped people listen to my uh, news and, and cover it. So uh, when we launched Capo, um, it, it did very well. It, it doubled what I previously thought was my best launch ever in, in Tape Deck. So um, that was very exciting and it satisfied my worry that you know, with this existing software out there, nobody would be looking to buy the software because there are entrenched um, software packages in, the, in this market. And that wasn't the case, and I did validate that it was worth pursuing. Right. And yours isn't typical. What's the, what's the price point of Capo? Uh, that's actually a funny thing. At the time, it was, uh, it was I believe, um, $50 Yeah, at, at that time. I had started out with a lower price, um, intending to do it as an introductory sale, uh, knowing full well that all the extra stuff that was sort of missing from Capo was around the corner. And I felt that, um, you know, I'll let people use the price as the differentiating factor that, okay, maybe it's a little bit less featured than the other packages, but, you know, um, you save a bit of money by doing that. Um, and then uh, I moved up to the final price of $50 when I went and um, shipped that update that included the effects. Um, yeah, and you were saying that wasn't typical, the, the price? Yeah, I mean, how, yeah, I mean um, what, what made you come up with that price point? Um, it was actually an easy decision because that was what everyone charged. That was, <laughs> so that was, was fairly price. typical. Uh, yeah, the other software packages were fifty dollars, and I'm very aware of the fact that pricing does send a message. Um, and at the time, uh, we didn't have the race to the bottom that we are facing right now in software, so I was able to make a more logical <laughs> pricing decision like that, and I priced it accordingly to match the competitors' pricing. I definitely except for the first version where I did want to make it a little bit cheaper because of the lack of features, um, I didn't want to send that message that it was inferior in any way. Yeah. Um, so, so what about now? How does that, uh, the price point, how do you come with the price point currently? <laughs> that, that's a whole other story. And that could take a whole episode of the show. Um, so I guess we should talk about Capo 2 as well, because Capo 2 was sort of, when there was a sea change in, in the features of, of what Capo did. So Capo 1 was, was mostly about testing the market and creating something that was equivalent in features if you're checking off boxes, but surpassed all the other products in terms of its polish and its user interface and so on and so forth. Um, Capo 2 was my opportunity to take my signal processing background from, from stuff I learned while building fuzz measure and doing something that nobody has ever done before. And that was what um, I now call the spectrogram. And what that allows you to do is um, not just hear your music, but visualize your music. And it even gives you the opportunity to draw on top of that spectrum hmm. um, to kind of correlate the notes you're seeing and hearing. And when drawing the what you what notes you're hearing, it actually tabs out the music for you below. Um, effectively, really? what I had done was replace the pad of paper that you would normally have on your desk while you're hitting fast forward and rewind and trying to listen to music. You still had to write it down somewhere. And so what I had done was created a way for you to annotate your music without even pulling out a pen and paper. Hmm. And and it was faster and it was, you know, potentially more accurate and it was great. And that was a huge launch. The, the 2.0 launch was, was incredible. And, um, but again, uh, when the app store shipped in 2011, everything changed. I, um, hit the app store in 2011 and all of my previous sales records were just dwarfed by, by what I was able to get uh, from the app store. Um, so what uh, can you give people an idea what that means? I, I, I think it was about, um, at the time, I, I want to say it was about three or four times what my previous uh, daily sales number was. 
um, you know, I sort of had mentally I have daily sales records and, and monthly sales records. I mean, the company isn't a multi-million dollar business that has developers around the world. It's still a small company. Um, and I recognize that I write niche niche products for, for smaller markets. Um, and so, well, I would think the guitar market is, is not that small though, right? It's huge. <laughs> it's so huge. But um, if we want to start playing that game, we can start throwing qualifiers in there. Okay, so you think of the guitar market as however many bazillion dollars a year. I think it's it's in the billions of dollars a year. It might, have, might even be in the tens of billions of dollars a year. Um, when you're talking about guitars, effects, uh, software for everything, like that whole market. Okay, well, if you think about all the guitarists in the world, how many of them are using computers? Because you can, you can think of older, older um, at the time, you know, when iPhones weren't as crazy and all that stuff. But if you think about, there's a smaller market now of, of tech-savvy people. Okay, now you take that market. How many of those people are using Macs? Well, now you're getting a little smaller. Okay, well, how many of those Mac-using guitar players are learning music by ear? Now you're getting even smaller. So when you start thinking in terms of that, but how many want to learn by ear? <laughs> yeah. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I and I recognize that, but um, yeah. So I, I recognize that I am in a niche market. Um, the market is growing like crazy, and um, what's more important to me is that the market of the Mac using side is also growing quite fast. Um, if you've looked at, at graphs of you know PC sales growth versus Mac sales growth over the last couple of years, it's you know it's it's a very different picture, and um, so yeah, the market is growing, um, but still I, I consider it a niche market um, compared to say Angry Birds. <laughs> right. um, everyone wants to throw birds at things, right? Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of that. So capo. So for someone who doesn't have the notoriety, so how did that? I guess so. In two, capo two, that's when you launched it into the the app store. No, capo two shipped before the app store. It was almost like a relaunch when the app store hit. Right. I, I mean, that was your first one in the launch in the right. out of capo in the in the app store. Right. So what had happened was, um, I had submitted capo to the app store uh, and did. I think I did press release around it, or I may have had some kind of a version update to go with it. I, I did something that was press worthy, and I don't recall what it was. But um, I did launch it on the App Store, and, and that's when you know I had really good sales. And that year was um, the first year of the App Store, and hence the first year that the Design Awards required you to be on the App Store in order to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that was when um, I, I later went on to win an Apple Design Award for, for Capo 2 on the Mac. Uh, that was in June of that year uh, when the developer conference happened. Won the Design Award and had yet another boost of sales from the, from the press relating to that. Hmm. So it was... Um, so what do they know. give you? When you win the Design Award, they send you to Disneyland? What, what do they give you? No, no. Um, so when I won this design award, uh, I won a, um, it was a Mac, a 13 inch MacBook Air, a 64 gig uh, iPad uh, with the 3G on it, and uh, a 64 gig iPod touch. So, you know, they gave me, they gave me some, some toys to go home with, which was, which was exciting. Nice. Um, but the coolest thing is they give you that cube, uh, their, their award cube. And uh, I got one over here. I was requested that I show it off. Yes, I want to see it. Um, it's made out of aluminum, and when you touch it, it lights up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty cool, um, and it's you know it was it was a it was a real uh, surprise. It was um, it was amazing. It um, it felt more exciting than the first time that I won the award. Mostly because I felt like the product actually had some appeal so that I could um, actually use that as something to drive further sales. Yeah. And, and it helped. It, it definitely helped. So what about Capo 3.0? 3, 3 so we had one, two, and then now currently three. How was that getting out to the market? 
Capo 3 was a whole new experience. Um, first off, when during that year in 2012, while I was um, doing very well with the App Store, I had made a decision that instead of investing uh, into some help or, or um, you know, further advertising and stuff like that, I decided to sort of um, uh, invest in myself and my family, so to speak. And we decided to, to build a new home. So that took a lot of my time over that year. Uh, at the same time, I was kind of forced to incorporate my business. Um, I had previously operated yeah. as a sole proprietorship. Yeah, so what happened with that? Because I remember we were talking about one of the things you wish you would have done earlier. Um, that was uh, the advice of my accountant uh, for the years that I had worked with him was there was a magic number where once you hit this number, it is no longer um, beneficial to, or sorry, until you hit this number, it is not beneficial financially to be uh, incorporated. And um, the, the amount of money it would take to maintain the corporation would outweigh you know, your tax benefit. And what had happened was when I launched on the App Store, I had basically um, exceeded that number very early in the year. So I was kind of stuck being forced to incorporate. And I think it caught both me and my accountant by a surprise. So we were kind of scrambling to do all that. That involved some some work around valuation and so on and so forth. So that was that was a big project um, that involved lawyers and accountants and and me to some extent. And then at the same time, I'm building a house which has a million different um, you know little questions that need to be answered. Um, things ranging from what color brick do you want to what color mortar do you want in between the brick. <laughs> so. <laughs> Lots of, you know, lots of little uh, tasks over the year that sort of took away from the core development of the products. Yeah. And, um, but I went into that knowing that I wanted to put myself into that stuff and I wanted to focus on, on all that important um, stuff. So um, during that time, the product got um, some sort of more superficial updates and at the same time, I was um, facing challenges that were coming from external sources. So there were updates to the operating system that were coming out. Yeah. Um, there were new requirements to be on the App Store in terms of, you know, there were security requirements and so on. I see. Um, it, it wasn't like I just, you know, clicked a button and shipped for the App Store. That actually took quite a bit of engineering effort to, to make the product comply with the App Store rules. Yeah. Um, how does so, that affect you when they come out with these new updates? How does that affect you as a developer? And how does that affect your business? It's actually quite taxing. Um, as Apple starts dictating um, what is going on in their platforms and what they want developers to focus on, you are now kind of being you're you're being forced to put down the important features and functionality in your application in order to just sort of meet the status quo. Um, you, I'll, I'll give the example of, of, of the iPhone 5 launch. Um, you know, I had Capo on the iPhone, and, and Capo on the iPhone is um, a very different product than the desktop, but it's still a great product. And when the iPhone 5 came out, I suddenly was faced with the problem that I need to support a new screen in, I think it was two weeks or something. Oh, wow. Basically, hey, great, our screen's getting taller. These are the dimensions, and in two weeks, your customers are going to be buying this. Um, so no pressure. I was, you're right, exactly. And so there's a lot of that um, um, incoming external pressure that you need to you need to be uh, aware of it. You need to be on top of Did it. Did they give you early notice of this, or no? What? No. no. And it's. So how time. do you do that? Do you have to spend like 24 hours a day just updating it for, until it launches? What do you do? On one hand, it's important that you try and get in on this stuff as fast as possible because Apple loves to show off examples of their new technology. So if you can ride this wave, um, you can have... Um, 
good fortune in in you know your products in terms of you know, promotion and so on and so forth. It's not a it's not a guarantee. Um, however, you want to try to take advantage of that stuff. There are very many products out there that still have not updated to support the taller screen, and some of those products are probably still doing okay. But um, the point is. I want to run a certain kind of company with a certain kind of, of perception about quality and, and attention to detail. So when, when they say jump, I say how high and I, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And as a result, uh, by playing that game, I'm forced into a role where when they're firing more of that stuff out to you more quickly, you are, um, you suddenly are put in a, in a compromised position where all that time that you have to spend on development is now being um, sucked into, you know, I'm no longer working for me, I'm now working for Apple. Right. Um, that has its challenges. Um, but, you know, I think it was more of a challenge during that period where I was also, you know, building a house and incorporating a business. and. Right. One point I forgot was I was learning how to do proper accounting, so to speak. So I'm also learning accounting software and trying to, um, you know, wrap my head around the craziness that exists in accounting software packages. Um, and, I mean, with Cable 3.0, um, when you release it, I mean, up to this point, it seems like you put stuff out there, you've gotten this notoriety, you know, you'll put all these press releases, you'll make updates, and it's been very successful. It's done really well. But yeah. some of the reality behind it is, you have to really go all in with with Capo Three Mineral. Can you tell people a little bit about what you what you had to do just with your salary alone to launch this this great new version? Yeah. So what I had done was um, I, I was in this period building my house, you know, trying to scrape by with um, with my existing products, like keeping on top of them, getting updates out there, fixing bugs, staying on top of Apple's changes. And eventually I got to a point where finally, okay, the, the accounting stuff and the, and the um, incorporation, that all died down. So I had a little bit more time, but the house was sort of heating up at the same time. But I started to sense that the, the, the demand for my time outside of the business was, was finally letting up. But then once, once you're now back to reality and fully engaged in the business again, you realize wow, it's been so many months and I have all this stuff I wanted to do and I've only accomplished so little of it. So at that point I decided I need to, you know, if I don't at least put the call out there for somebody to, to help me out with development, um, I can't say I didn't at least try to find help while I was in this phase of, of feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. And so uh, I did that. And I talked to a few people about helping out, and I think I had ultimately given up on it, to be honest. Um, you were looking for other developers? I was looking for uh, just one other developer, somebody who could kind of complement my own skills or, or, or even just, just help, like in general. I mean, there's a lot of tasks that aren't necessarily requiring somebody to, to know everything about uh, signal processing or audio. There's a lot of other tasks that need to get done that are equally important. Um, and frankly, you know, that type of stuff starts to fall behind when I am sucked into more of the, the technical low level side. So um, I had effectively, at the same time of doing that, bumped up my own development work and really crunched um, on stuff. And then finally somebody uh, reached out and, and said he might be able to help, talk to him a little bit, and then we got started. And so in doing so, I am now... Um, in addition to having to cover my own salary, I'm covering somebody else's salary and sales are just going down, 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 down because, um, I mean, that's just the, the sales curve. Like there's, there's no advertising going on. There's no releases going out. There's nothing newsworthy happening. So things are just spiraling as, as they should down the toilet. And, um, at, Around June, so at WWDC, I had somebody in place helping me out with, with that stuff. And um, at that time, I had a meeting with, with a friend of mine who um, had some suggestions about um, potential contacts 
that would help me out more on the marketing and PR side. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I've already got the developer helping me and that's going to help immensely, but I need to support him and I can't support him plus do all this marketing and, and PR stuff at the same time. So I'm definitely going to reach out to these people and try to get some help with that. Long story short, I found myself with somebody helping um, on the PR side and somebody helping in uh, a marketing capacity, specifically uh, in the area of artist relations. Um, what that basically means is, you know, somebody who has contacts in the music industry can, uh, on my behalf, go and reach out to to that network, and you know, give them copies of the software and solicit feedback. You know, do you like the software? Does it is it usable to you? Um, and long story short, we we ended up casting this net out and finding that holy cow, you know, this this product isn't just for guys trying to learn guitar. This is even satisfying guys who've been doing it for 20, 30 years in some cases. Um, you know, this is fantastic. This is this is great to learn that this has an even wider appeal than we thought. So, um, however, at the same time, again, we've got the burn rate going up. I've got now a developer and two other people helping me out on contracts. And I got to a point where I'm not able to cover my salary and their salary at the same time. So the decision was made that I'm effectively ending my salary until further notice. And uh, it started out as, okay, I'll just do it for four weeks and then, okay, now it'll be six weeks. And then I've still yet to start that, that hose back up and I'm still incomeless. And um, so what happened was, uh, like you said, I kind of put it out on the line and decided um, you know, based on past experiences and past successes, and now based on the fact that I have help in a lot of other things, my output is able to go up. So basically all signs are pointing to this being a better launch than ever before. So while I was putting everything on the line, I didn't feel like I was really gambling or anything like that because, um, you know, past experience plus, um, you know, the insight to know that more help is always a good thing um, would put me in a healthy position. So Capo 3 launched on October 7th and we became the top paid music app on the Mac App Store. Wow. Um, you know, beating Logic Pro for a couple days. And congratulations, that's great. Thanks, yeah. And and you know, it was it was amazing. You know, you talk about my my sales records, you know, and one was two times better, one was four times better, one was six times better. Well, you know, you take that last previous sales record and it was, you know, two times better on launch day. But what had happened later in the week was Apple had featured us as an editor's choice at the top of the Mac App Store. So now what I had done was maybe even 50% more than that record day, you know, that day. So if you're following along, that works at the three times better than my previous one day sales record. And I was over the moon because you know, it, it kind of validated that all this hard work and, and hiring out help in the places where I just, I couldn't afford to put my time in, yeah. um, worked out. Yeah. I may have and, to ask, because I'm sure this is what's going on in the audience's mind is, so what does that equate to in dollars when you say three times it's your record day? What? Well, what? I don't like sharing numbers. It's, they, they're not huge numbers. I'm, I'm not making millions of dollars a year, but uh, I'll, 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 I'll say it's, it's uh, definitely helping to uh, pay myself back for a couple of months of salary. I'll say that um, in a day. <laughs> so um, yeah, there, there's that. I have to ask that question, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been great. The the money's been been nice. It's it's. It's not the huge dollars that I know that other companies have been able to pull off. Um, like we, we didn't hit the number one top paid spot on the app store. Other apps have that weren't Apple apps. Um, so, you know, we're definitely not, you know, magicians <laughs> in that regard. Um, however, with that said, I feel like it was a very strong success considering uh, the fact that we do have a much smaller market than something like um, you know, 
if it's like a productivity application that everyone could could use. I, I think there's an app now that's uh, that's topping the paid chart, and it's you know a two dollar mail app. Like everyone could use a mail app, right? right. So um, you know, I'm I'm very proud of what we accomplished for our launch, um, but you know, I'm not suddenly hiring three more people as a result. Right. I, I'm basically now happy that I can continue on this trajectory to um, continue f having help, which is fantastic, and, um, you know, potentially add a little bit more help, say, in the next three to six months, I hope. Um, so, yeah, it, it was an exciting launch. It, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, I was... You know, you talk about entrepreneurs that, that wear a lot of hats. I was editing videos, doing web development, doing software development, doing button fixing, doing QA, all of this stuff. Yeah, how do you even keep up with, I mean, all that stuff? How do you even keep up with uh, questions that come in or support requests? Um, I do handle my own support right now. Uh, some companies outsource it. And actually, for a little while, I had people helping me with that. Um, it works great, and I really liked the period where, where I had somebody doing full-time support for me. The problem I had with, with outsourcing support is um, mostly my fault. And that is, there are a lot of moving parts in the app and a lot of moving parts in the sales process, say, or pricing or whatever, where on a launch day, you're going to get inundated with emails from people who are looking for uh, answers to questions that only I know. And so um, right. outsourcing that can only be so helpful during a launch because what good is somebody doing the work for you if three it quarters of the questions. email is getting forwarded to me anyway for, for insight. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to let go of, um, having let go of it on, on a couple occasions. Still, it's something that needs to be done, and like I said, it's it's my fault. I need to be better about um, making things clear, um, not just externally, but also internally, so that people know how to deal with uh, that stuff. Yeah. But with that said, I mean, how awesome is it to to be the guy getting those emails from customers who are telling you how great your product is and how happy they are that you did it, and and so on and so forth. I mean. Like it's one thing to, to, to make money, but it's another thing to to be validated in, in the sense that the product you built is is making people really, really happy. And yeah. um, you know, in some cases I don't want to say changing their lives, but you know, when people tell you, Hey, I haven't played for fifteen years, but when I saw this product come out, I suddenly grab my guitar again and I'm motivated to start learning. Yeah. Like it's you know, you get all kinds of stories ranging from that to you know, people who have been doing it for many years and say, you know, they're happy just to have more time on their hands because they're learning songs faster than they, than they did before. And in some cases, they're learning songs where they had kind of given up on learning songs because it's too time consuming. Right. So there, there's just all these stories coming in that, I mean, it's it helps to make you feel better after those days and weeks of just sheer crunching on everything every little detail rereading sure. the designing and building the website and oh it's <laughs> it's a lot it's, it's a lot to handle so you know you've said a lot of valuable information here what's one thing the audience should take away and start doing today um well i can i i think i can only really give advice for people sort of in a software capacity um, and it might apply elsewhere but you know when you're when you're working on something like this where you're, you're building a, something from scratch and you're trying to um, you're trying to get it out on the market at the end of the day you need you need to pick you kind of need to pick a date and stick to it you need to um, really just focusing, uh, you need to really focus on shipping the product. And sometimes that's going to mean um, 
leaving some things in a slightly imperfect state, or it could mean cutting a feature entirely just just to make the date. Um, I have two examples of that. Uh, one is, you know, if, if if you've got sort of a tricky issue in, in your product, um, mostly a software thing, if, if you've got something that's causing you a little bit of trouble, you've been doing a lot of investigation, you, you have to have a good gut feeling for what a high priority issue is versus not. You know, if it's if it's like a little drawing bug that shows up maybe one in a hundred times and it and it's almost impossible for you to reproduce in the first place, um, you know, and you let something like that slide, would you rather have, you know, you could get stuck in one of two situations. One situation is you're just pulling your hair out trying to fix this damn thing and you slide your release date by weeks that turn into months that because you know, for every one of these, there's another dozen more hiding under the covers. And if you're going to be that anal about everything, you know, you're just you're never going to ship. Um, you're in a better position if you ship the product and you have, you know, hundreds of people emailing you about this problem. Well, there's two good things about it. One, your product is out there and doing well, and people are resonating with it. There's something about your product that has worked. And two you're probably going to have a lot more feedback and insight into the bug because now you're, you're getting reproductions from many more people and they can tell you their story of how they got there and you may fix it a lot faster than if you tried to do it yourself. Um, I mean, some people might point to that as bad software practice, but I say, you know, well, you, how many products have you shipped out the door? Um, there's, uh, I don't know if it's a Steve Jobs quote, but, you know, there, there's the quote that real artists ship and shipping is the most important thing and, and it's it's an art form in itself is just deciding where that line is that you can cut features cut you know bug fixes or whatever um, and there's and there's nothing wrong with shipping a product with a known issue that you're still working on on the side um, in fact we had a few of those that we we had shipped um, our binary to Apple and soon after found a, a, a bug in it but it was already a couple of days into the review queue. And if we had replaced our binary in the middle of waiting for the review queue, we actually would have got bumps to start our wait again. And so what I had decided was let's, let's fix this bug and any other bugs that we find so that as soon after the product ships, we'll find the hot issues from the customers, um, but we'll have another couple aces up our sleeve so that we get that maintenance release out, release out quickly and make our customers happy. It helps to demonstrate that you do care about quality and that you, you know, you are committed to making sure that you're stomping those bugs constantly. Um, right. Software is, is a unique in that in that perspective where it is a a product that you can, you know, you don't just make it and send it out there and it's done. It's constantly evolving. There's always going to be things that you never expected, um, and in fact. If you think that there's never going to be a bug in your software, then you are completely delusional. Because, guess what? What what is what is out there now? You know, Apple might have yet another device that they're going to throw at us, like a new Mac with a new type of processor or something wacky like that, where your product that's been working fine for a couple of months is now suddenly broken. So, you just yeah. got to be ready for it, and you have to. And have that's it. good advice. You know, just don't try to make everything perfect. Get it out there. Let people try it get valuable feedback, and then just keep shipping after that. Um, yeah, I love that advice, Chris. And I have one last question for you. Before I do, tell us where can people find out more? What's the best site? If people want to thank you uh, for your great advice, where can they, where can they reach out to you? Um, I've, I'm, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle on Twitter is Lisho, L-I-S-C-I-O. And um, I'm also at uh, supermegaultragroovy.com. I'll leave that up to the reader to figure that one out. <laughs> and um, you can find Capo on uh, capoapp.com, uh, fuzzmeasure is at fuzzmeasure.com, and tape deck is at tapedeckapp.com. Yeah, and everyone should check those out. I mean, just to get some design functionality ideas because it's just beautiful the way it's laid out and how everything functions. And my last question goes into what you just said, which is, Where'd you come up with the name Super Mega Ultra Groovy? 
Um, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, I came up with a name back in like 1999 or something like that. Um, it was it was actually a Simpsons episode where they go to Japan and they're on a game show that has a ridiculous name. <laughs> it's like super family, happy, fun, something. And so what I did was I, I wanted a name that had a, a backronym of some sort. So it does, it does uh, go down to smug, super mega ultra groovy. So I, I just kind of, you know, took the idea of, you know, wacky, uh, expletive adjectives, smashed them together into something that had an interesting um, acronym and, and it worked. <laughs> I knew there was some funny story behind it. Yeah. yeah. Chris, thank you so much. This has been great. And, uh, you know, everyone should check out the site. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I hope it was valuable.